Let me briefly introduce Stephen, Stephen, CEO of Asia Mouse. I didn't actually know that Asia Mouse had a CEO because I always thought it was sort of an affiliate under Cathay, Cathay Pacific. Yeah, we're wholly owned subsidiary, so we run ourselves like a little startup actually within the big corporate. So Yeah, so, uh, so Stephen has been CEO since July 2011, so a good six years. I think he started off with four million members. Uh, half population Hong Kong, and then now you have 9.6? Yeah, we now have 9.6 million, million, so approximately a million gr uh, member growth per year. Half of them actually, now our population of our membership, half of them in Greater China and the other half in the rest of the world. So. Right, right. And then I have Stephen's Asia mouse card with me <laughs> right now. I wonder how many mouse, uh, how much you know, virtual currency is there with me. Now, um, my card is not black, no platinum, diamond, this is blue. But out of your 9.6 million members, uh, not sure how, how many members have been you know, giving feedback to you on a regular basis, but I did my own straw poll with uh, nine people, <laughs> nine, nine Asian Miles members. So I think even in a tech, tech, tech savvy and financial savvy crowd uh, like this, because I spoke to these Asian Miles members uh, in the RISE conference in the past uh, yesterday, and they seem to be a bit confused because they thought, why is there Marco Polo and why is there Asia Miles? And they don't know the difference between club points and then miles. So, I mean, this may be a pretty basic level questions, but if a lot of people are having this confusion, it might be worth clarifying. So let me clarify. So. You know, uh, Marco Polo Club is the loyalty program for Cafe Pacific, the airline. You can only earn Marco Polo points through flying, no other ways, okay? And Asia Mouse is actually the rewards, the lifestyle and rewards program that actually on the side. So if you're a Marco Polo member, you're automatically also an Asia Mouse member. But the Asia Mouse is different, is you can earn on multiple pillars. You can earn on flying, you can earn on traveling, you can earn on credit card, you can, you can earn on even on dining in Hong Kong. And you can burn, basically, the, on the redemption side, you can also actually redeem on multiple sectors. Travel, air, airline ticket, hotel, uh, you know, and all sort of other actual experiences. I mean, earning is exciting, redeeming is even more exciting, burning, not so much. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But uh, to be honest, I ha I've tried to redeem a flight myself one year in advance. Because I know airlines have wait lists, they have a like, quarter, 3% of the flight list allocated to awards. And even if it's one year advance, I, I, I'm told there's no, no more available. It's, to be honest, it's a pain point there, among other problems. So what is, what is your process of designing the redemption process? Sure. Yeah. sure. I, I think that's a, in general, that's not a surprise. Every single time I go to a new dinner, you know, my first 15 minutes is explaining actually why people cannot get a, get a seat. So yeah. It, it, uh, yeah, I think, um, well, airlines sometimes, uh, they, they open up inventory in various times. So what we do actually for looking at customer experience really is we are very focused in understanding really from the customer what they want and what the process. So there are two things actually we work on. One is really about the experience. The other one is really about the availability, right? So the experience, first and foremost, if you look at it, is uh, people were giving us feedback that it's not so easy to find out which day is available. You know, I know it's not always available, but which day is available. So we go on and actually do a lot of research, and we have a new, new uh, feature that just show called Flight Finder. If you go on our website right now, you can actually go in this two-way. You can type in, actually, uh, and look at the calendar. In the future three months, it will show you, you put in destination, which date actually is available and which day is not. No, it doesn't work. I've tried it. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, it works. <laughs> So, well, usually, usually members tell me it doesn't work because we're not giving them the exact day and the exact flight they want. Is it because so. I'm only a blue car? No, 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 oh. no, no, no. So I think two things. One, that is experience enhancement. The other one, actually, we introduced in the last two years is, well, sometimes on the base tier, you cannot actually get a seat. So we, we, we actually added the tier one and tier two, the priority one and priority two tier, so, so as, to, as to give more choices. So that's another way to do it. Yeah, but all these decisions, right, how you design it, what's the, what's the thinking process? Because yeah. you're, you're high on de design thinking. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, how yeah. Have, you, have you actually applied that to you know, the design of this you're process? Well, you know, in, in Asian Mars, we, we strive to be so-called stakeholder-centric. So our stakeholder is not just our customer. So first and foremost, our customer is very important. But if you look at it, we are a B2B2C ecosystem. So who do we need to actually satisfy? First and foremost, all of you here, many of you are our members. So we're going to make sure that your members are being taken care of. And we also need to take care of really our, our, our partner. Cafe Pacific also is a partner. So we use a process of, on deep empathy. 
So we we arrange uh, actually focus groups. We also uh, you know to talk to actually people about their pain points. We also have an online community that is about 8,000 strong uh, members. Actually, they are very willing to give us digital feedbacks on our uh, online community feedback. So we, we go talk to them a lot. We go over the process of understanding, and then try to find out pain points, and then try to find solutions after. Mm. So. OK, uh, I'll just try it. But I know that a lot of startups come to you, right? especially over here. They come to you, and they propose having Asian miles on a lot of e-commerce platforms as a payment option. Mm -hmm. So if you look at like, you know, uh, the miles and points and everything, they are basically a virtual currency. But it, you, you, you don't seem to be very uh, for that idea. So what is your, your thoughts on that? Well, uh, yes. Uh, yes and no. I think, I think people need to think about where do you want to stand, right? You know, for some rewards program, they are denominated very clearly on um, on the value. So five dollar equal to one dollar worth of actually discount. Mm -hmm. So so some programs are very much denom denominated in in a dollar sense. I think you know if you want to be a virtual currency, if you want to be a currency, there needs to be a currency trace is tra is, is is actually interchangeable, and also has a very clear value. Uh, so, isn't it good if it's comparable to the US dollar? Isn't it good? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one thing about it, but we in Asian miles had a slight different reservation. Is, is, is we don't want people to anchor on thinking about five miles equal to one dollar because we are not anchoring on the dollar sign. We're anchoring on the experience. We're trying to anchor on when you have these miles, what we can provide to you. You know, what we can provide to you. For example, you can use miles to redeem a concert ticket. You know, and the concert ticket is not just about the concert ticket, 780 Hong Kong dollar. But it's still very transactional. People still tag the value to, to what yeah, is yeah, already uh, in the yeah. market. A, a, lot of them, a lot of them do. A lot of them do. So, but I think in our sense, we try to do two things. We try to actually first make sure that we provide quality redemption options for enhancing the experience. It's oh. a holistic mm -hmm. value. It's not just about... $500 for something. It's about the ease of getting it or might be actually for a concert ticket for somebody in Hong Kong, it's very difficult to get. So we, we provide the ease and it creates more value. So we want people to think about the experience more rather than actually always calculating. Is there a recent um, example of this concert ticket redemption? How have you refined it? Yeah, we have a lot. You know, like last few years, we have Jay Chow, we have, uh, you know, we have May Day, you know, we attend. Um, and we're also doing a lot of those. So, so we, we do an example on being very customer centric is we have actually go in members' home and we go to a concert and ask people what are the pain points on actually concert ticket in Hong Kong. The biggest pain point is actually availability, right, in simple terms. And most concert tickets are chosen to be using a first come, first serve. Uh, mechanism to actually buy. But I mean, if you think deeper and ask our mem members, the first come, first serve actually mentality is the one that gives the most pain. So if you look yeah. at Asian miles, when we have tickets for redemptions, we're not doing first come, first serve. Mm -hmm. We're basically telling members that you just, we send you EDM, we say within the next three days, just push one button and say if you want to redeem, and then we'll do a raffles. So it's not the most fair because people think that actually first come, first serve is the most fair. But at the end of the day, what matters is not fairness. What matters is actually what creates value to the member is convenience and ease. Mm. Do you also get a lot of startups asking you the difference between a CRM system and a rewards program? Because both, you know, uh, are based on the concept of, of uh, uh, comm commoditization of points and uh, also consumer data, turning data into communication. Oh, so yes, yes. What is uh, the difference? A lot of time I have uh, people come to me by saying that, well, my bosses told me that I need to create a points program. Why? Or because everybody talk about points program and CRM, we need to create one. So I, my advice to them is actually think very carefully. At the end of the day, I advise every single company, they should be really looking at doing good CRM. CRM is basically just putting your customer in a database, finding a way that they agree for you to communicate to them, and you communicate to, communicate to them in a nice way, in a very good storytelling fashion. But a CRM program is different from actually creating a points program. My, my, my experience running uh, our rewards program in six years from very complex, compact to simple is, if you create a points program, there's only one thing you have to ask. Is there a reason for people to collect your points? 
Absolutely not, because it, if the customer doesn't redeem the points, your, you as a company still stands to gain. It's like, okay. I, actually, no that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. A lot of people <laughs> think, a lot of people think that programs like Asian Miles are secretly trying to actually not tell you that your miles is expiring, <laughs> so that when you expire, I can profit from it. We talk about that as a toxic profit. You know, right. it's like dating. Mm, mm. You know, when a lady actually not talk to me anymore, do you think actually you have a very engagement with their mouth first? No. When they stop talking to you and stop actually doing anything with you, right. that means you no longer have a relationship with them. Mm. So, mm. so I, what we think is important is really to, to have the engagement. If you have points, we want you to use it. Mm. So, say for startups like this, whether they're in the alpha, beta, or, or mm. at different stages, at what point in, their, in the size of their user base or customers, customer base should then think about having a points program? I you know, think whether it's consumer facing or mm. different types of, yeah. I think from day one, you should have a CRM program. Mm -hmm. Day one. That means actually having a customer database and think about how you communicate to them and how you build relationship. But on the points program, you really have to ask yourself, do you have anything actually in hand that you can provide value? You know, if it is a supermarket, the points redemption is for redeeming a cookie, redeeming actually two cents off, $10. Is it worth creating a points program? You might be better off just to provide a discount. You might be better off to provide coupons. Remember, points is a means to an end. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, so don't actually always fixate it on that. A lot of the great companies actually do points program. They have something in hand mm. that can provide that is highly aspirational and highly discounted. It's all about value, right? So if you look at the most successful points program out there, usually anchor on some sort of asset that they can discount a lot, like airline, Hotels, yeah, those are perishable, they can use. Mm. But it's, you know, talking about this, this philo philosophical uh, uh, definition of value, mm. I mean, who is to define value? Is it you? Is it the consumer? Because, say, for example, a lot of credit cards on the market offering free toasters and stuff, there's absolutely no consumer inside. Why do you need to give cons con toaster? Is it because you've got to deal with welcome? <laughs> and uh, so how do you define value? Should it be, should it be consumer driven and, instead of you know, company driven? So that's the whole well, stakeholder yeah, yeah, I think we try argument. to be stakeholder centric. We ask the consumer what matters to you. And then we also ask as a business actually what matters to the business. At the end of the day, if you're purely customer centric, it might not work. Think about it. What do we want on our next iPhone? Bigger screen, sharper screen, you know, more memory, and free iCloud. Everything free, right? We want cheaper stuff only. At the end of the day, negotiation is all about what you value the most that I can provide at a lower cost, mm -hmm. and what you can give back to me, actually, that you're willing to provide it if I can provide value to you. So I think that's, that's more important in thinking about understanding all the needs and then rank it in hierarchy, and then you try to address the top pain point or top opportunity one by one, and then do trade-offs. So we all should think about stakeholder-centric, not just purely customer-centric. Uh, that seems to be, again, so a lot of startups are pitching themselves as uh, being customer-centric. Um, when can you, can you share probably the last question, mm -hmm. like using, turning data into insight? I no. think for a lot of data-based-centric companies, they're having trouble with that. Sure. Uh, um, for some of you who have moved into more data-driven organization, uh, we have been naughty in Asian Mouse. We're saying that we're not data-centric. We're not actually uh, data-centric. And as you'll be quite weird because we have a big data science team. What we're trying to say is that we're insight-driven. We're not data-driven. Data is part of an input. Data is a quantitative research and you need the qualitative research side, right? Sometimes data tell you a syndrome, syndrome a, a point of view, but actually it doesn't give you the reasons. So you need the quantitative and qualitative to be combined. So what we manually is, you should be driving your organization to be insight driven rather than actually data driven only. So we combine qualitative and quantitative research together and then find insights. And what do you do with the insight? You gotta do something about it. So you take actions and test and learn, and then you measure the value, and you go in big cycle. So that's actually how you drive. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. It, w if we're too data-centric, will we then produce totally useless products like that juicer? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Over-engineered. You know, we, we talk about a juicer, right? The 2000 juicer, very <laughs> nicely, <laughs> nicely engineered. But I always tell startup, you know, never and never anchor on a solution. If you are, you are a startup only anchor on a solution, I will not invest in you always anchor in the problem or the opportunity you're trying to solve. Mm. You know, 
think about solution is secondary. You can think about many ideas. The most important part is what are you trying to solve, and is that actually a big enough problem that, or big enough opportunity for you to go after? Great, fascinating. Uh, and the solution for the conference to continue is for us to, uh, for us to thank Stephen and then leave the stage for other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.